I'd like to just welcome everyone. We're going to get started with our small, intimate group today. And uh, for those who might be watching from their desks, I'm Naraya Brodus from the Office of the President. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to another Moving Dartmouth Forward session. Today, we're talking with Roger Woolsey of the Center for Professional Development and Dan Parrish from the Office of Al Alumni Relations. And they're going to talk to us about professional development for life, really serving both our current students and graduates uh, wherever they may be. For those of you who have participated in our sessions before, you know that our usual framework is to spend a little bit of time with our presenters sharing information about what's going on in their areas, and then really to open it up for discussion um, and your feedback and suggestions. So without further ado, Dan and Raj. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. We are dealing with, currently, an anemic labor market. We have high unemployment. We have even higher underemployment for recent college grads. Officials in Washington, D.C., along with future prospective students and their parents, are very concerned about affordability and student loan debt. But what they're concerned about with affordability is the ratio of input, college tuition, in relation to outcome, and that is post-graduate post success. As you can see, there is no other time in our country where professional development and preparedness is as important than it is currently today. And our primary purpose and process in the Center for Professional Development is to complement the wonderful work that is being done in the classroom with the best teaching faculty in the world by continuing that education and application in skill sets, competencies, and lifelong learning. And we do this through an ecosystem with faculty, with staff, alumni, parents, employers, and community leaders. And the major objective is to prepare our Dartmouth young men and women for postgraduate success. And in the Center for Professional Development, we define postgraduate success as admittance to graduate school, a fellowship, an employment opportunity, or commitment to service. But preparedness and professional development just doesn't end at graduation. It continues. And at this time, I'll reintroduce Dan Parrish, director of Dartmouth for Life. Great. Thanks, Raj. So because I work in alumni relations, I come at the topic of thinking about professional development and, and support of graduates and, and, and students and graduates from a perspective of thinking about three big pieces of this for, for my work in alumni relations. One is that we as an institution have an obligation and need to be proactive to supporting alumni as they progress from one stage of their career to the next. So there needs to be a commitment from the institution to continue to serve alums after they graduate. The work that Raj does with undergraduate students, the work that folks at their school or at Tuck or at Geisel do, that we, we as an institution need to keep pushing that forward after students graduate. We need to make it easy for alumni to find other alumni. So Dartmouth has this, this almost sort of mythic reputation nationally and around the world in terms of the strength of its, of its alumni network. Uh, we, we talk a lot about the family, the Dartmouth family. We talk a lot about these connections. And we need to make it really easy for people to find one another through technology, to find one another here on campus, alumni to alumni, to offer each other jobs, to just connect with one another around industry interests. And then on a similar note, we need to make it really easy for alumni, students, faculty, folks here on campus to connect with one another. So in particular, what, I'm, what I have at the front of my mind is thinking about the ways that we make it easy for alumni to offer jobs to current students, the way we make it easy for alumni to create internships, to create postgraduate opportunities for those students. We need to make it easy for alumni to come back to campus to share their expertise with students, or if they're already coming back to campus, we need to create easy avenues for them to connect with students. Um, and then the third piece of this is, is turning the equation around in the other direction and making it really simple for students to identify alumni by their expertise, by their industry, by what they do. So, so those are the, the, the real kind of the three big buckets that are, that are on my mind as we start work in alumni relations around supporting alumni in their career progression, but also in tapping into alumni expertise in service of students. Um, just this past weekend, just as a, as a brief kind of uh, aside and examples of some of the things that are happening, 
Um, Raj and I were talking on Friday, and uh, right before we went into the weekend, we said, you know, we've got great examples of where this works really well. So this past weekend, the Office of Entrepreneurialism and Tech Transfer sponsored Dartmouth Ventures here on campus. Hundreds of Dartmouth alums here in town connecting with current undergraduates and Tuck students who are launching businesses or trying to launch businesses or trying to figure out how to get their ideas off the ground. It was an amazing, amazing event, seeing folks interact with one another and seeing alums share their expertise and their experience with one another. And then on Sunday, Raj's office, the Center for Professional Development, the Dartmouth Outing Club, and our office co-sponsored an opportunity for, for undergraduate students who are interested in careers in the out of doors, and I, I can't remember the title of the event, but it had a great title. It was uh, something like Discover a World of Work in the Outdoors. Does that sound right? Something like that. Um, and it brought together 60 or 70 uh, current students with 20 alums who are working in fields around adventure, education and travel, those kinds, of, those kinds of areas. So we have examples of where this works, and I think for us the key is to develop um, mechanisms that, that, that uh, make it easy to happen, make it easy to have students and, and alumni connect with one another. So what Raj and I want to do today, rather than telling you about the things we're working on now and just giving you a lecture on this, is what we want to do is ask you, treat you as a focus group, ask you some questions about your ideas, about um, how to engage students and alumni, how to, how to make this place really successful at the, at the professional development mission. And as you answer those questions, we'll tell you about things that we're actually already doing. We'll respond to ideas that you've got and uh, things that we may not have thought of yet and see where that takes us. So our first big question is really basic uh, and really just at the, at the outset uh, designed to try to start some conversation. And that first big question is just starting with a definition. How should we be defining postgraduate preparedness for students and lifelong professional development for Dartmouth. How do we define what Dartmouth's role is in that for our students and our, and our graduates? Um, and what's the, what's the starting point as we think about postgraduate preparation for students? Where do we start with that? What is postgraduate preparedness? What, what does a student look like who's prepared for life after Dartmouth? And I will just, uh, for those who don't know, uh, Raj and I talked about this before and I forgot to mention it. Um, Raj is visually impaired, so if you raise your hand, I'll probably I'll, I'll try not to speak, but I'll tell Raj where the question's coming from and, uh, and may point some things out so he knows where the, where the question's coming from. But let's start with that. What's the definition? What does a student who leaves this place look like if they're prepared, and they're prepared particularly for a, for a successful life of professional development and ongoing professional growth? Now it's your turn. <laughs> and nobody's going to weigh in. Great. Okay. The, the one, I was part of the Dartmouth Ventures this, this past weekend, uh, and I think you know, there's kind of three things that we, we see. I mean, first can, of can, all, you know, I forgot to give you the. Can you just tell us who you? Are? I oh, know who you are, but can you tell us who okay. you are and, and where you fit in the community here? Okay. Uh, Bill Nice, class of '73. Okay. Um, and so the three things that that talking to the undergraduates and working with the undergraduates on the entrepreneurial initiative is kind of three things that I like to see. Okay, first of all, and that is confidence in their abilities as they come out of Dartmouth. Okay, that's the first thing. Second of all, is that uh, surprisingly is that Dartmouth is, you know, is substantially overrepresented in management consulting. And talking to the folks you know, at, at uh, McKenzie and at uh, Oliver Wyman and so forth, is that what they find is that they will hire Dartmouth students over Harvard students, over Penn students, over Cornell students. And the reason why is because of the breadth of their education. And the third thing that, that you know, actually has to come out, and that is you know, to, in fact, have flexibility. Okay? Because the jobs that we are currently seeing here in 2014 are, are no way going to be the jobs that are going to be available in 2022. Right. So again, you know, confidence. Okay, one. Number two is to, in fact, you know, continue to accentuate the breadth of, of the experience here at Dartmouth, um, and um, and then number three, of course, is to, in fact, remain flexible. Yeah, and you know, Rod, so the professional development accelerator that you guys are building, that confidence piece, um, it feels to me like some of what you're developing in terms of so soft skill um, training for students, how to interact with people, how to yeah. how to how to network in a way that builds a relationship and doesn't ask for a job fits with the confidence piece in some ways. Yeah, let's, let's talk about that just a little bit. We have created and we're launching for the class of 2018 as a professional development accelerator. 
And this is going to be for first years as they, as they enter Dartmouth. This is a signature program. No other institution, I believe, in the country has anything like this. The folks, the team and I in the Center for Professional Development look at students when they enter college as, as startups. They're starting up academically all over again, academic rigor, new faculty, they're competing amongst their peers, who have also in the top two or three percent in their high schools. Number two is pers uh, personal development, that they're going to go through cognitive dissonance all over again because of new values, new ways of learning, new vocabulary, new ways of looking at things, and their critical thinking continues to develop. And the third piece of that is what you mentioned, which is part of that professional development. Confidence continues to come up, and part of the PDA is to make sure that our young men and women of Dartmouth are excellent communicators, that they show confidence in front of employers, both in one-on-one, -on -one, but as well as in presentations. We want every Dartmouth alum, or graduate, as well as our alums, obviously, to communicate without a vocalized pause. We don't want students articulating ums, likes, you knows, ers, and ders. They shouldn't <laughs> coming out of Dartmouth, right? So we have what we refer to as workshops on communicating with confidence, that we are testing a pilot workshop on that, I believe, this week. The other thing that we're doing is we're working a lot on what we refer to as vignettes. These are small videos that are no longer than two minutes, and we already have a series on communication how to do a, a handshake and get the web of your hands with the employer, to how to communicate without an um or a like or a you know, posture, all of those things, so that our Dartmouth young men and women can communicate with confidence. The other thing that we're doing with these vignettes, for confidence sake, is more of the application. Every for-profit and non-profit, government and education, every male and female student needs to be more versed in Excel. And one of the things that we're going to do, before 18s even set foot on the campus of Dartmouth in the matriculation, is we're going to send out videos to them on basic Excel, how to put a spreadsheet together to manage their personal finances. The parents are going to love this. We're hoping that the <laughs> students are going to love this. And I'm also hoping that the faculty will love it. I know that we have SPSS and we have other ways of collecting data, interpreting data, but I think everybody needs to be versed, versed in, in Excel. Number two. Yes, we have a perceptual error, but every college and university that I've ever worked at has that same perceptual error that what we're doing is we're sending out men and women into finance and consulting. The first thing that the team did, and I've been here at Dartmouth now for 10 months, is they created a credo which addresses this very succinctly. That credo is dare to be different. We want to support the unique qualities and the differences of our Dartmouth students, that not everybody has a desire or an instant gratification to go into finance and or consulting. And to complement that, we have a goal to aggregate internship opportunities and employment opportunities, basically experiential learning as well, across industries as well as geographically. Because the other thing that comes up quite a bit, to be frank, is that a lot of our students want to stay on the East Coast corridor. And yet there are under opportunities in the Midwest, there are opportunities in the West Coast. We are developing those relationships in nonprofit. We're developing those relationships in retail. We have Bloomingdale's come to campus last fall. They're coming again. We have entrepreneurs or startups coming to campus and working with the great work that Trip Davis is working on. And I'm in constant communication with alumni relations, specifically with Dan, as well as our advancement teams and opening up more opportunities in a variety of different industries to address the concern of the perceptual error that it's finance and consulting. So wholeheartedly, I get it. I understand. And the third question was? Well, I, I think let's just stop there for a second. So you okay. talked about confidence, um, the breadth of the curriculum preparing students for, for a lot of different environments and then flexibility. And you, you were pointing to the consulting piece as a real positive, that we, we've got students who can come out of here with a lot of different, uh, a number of different majors and drop themselves down into different professions. And we've got a, I, one of the things, I, some of you know I worked for 21 years in, in admissions here and in other places. And I think that's part of the, part of the marketing challenge for, for places like Dartmouth, right, is to continue to remind people that we've got this broadly trained uh, group of students with, who can shift on the fly, who can be prepared for careers that haven't been invented yet. Agile. Um, be agile, be, sort of adjust uh, over the life of their career, 
um, without it being labeled as being trained to do nothing. I mean, I think that's part of the, uh, I think that's part of the ma marketing challenge. Uh, David from admissions is back up in the back there, I and mean, that's part of the ma marketing challenge for the institution, right? Is how do we get to what you hear from folks at places like Bain and Oliver Wyman and those places about uh, broadly trained Dartmouth alums being really good fits for those experiences and not being untrained. It's not, you know, not and not to. I don't know if there are faculty in the room. Um, you know, I, I know that we're not a vocational preparation uh, school, but, but on the other hand, we need to be able to tell folks that this broad-based education combined with internship opportunities, experiential learning, sets you up for success for the careers we don't know exist yet. Well, it's a compliment, right? So what we like I said when I started out, it's complementing what takes place in the classroom. And as I just got done talking to some folks about this morning, is that we want to complement what's going on in the classroom. And it shouldn't be about major especially in the liberal arts. I think students could study whatever they're passionate about. We shouldn't be concerned about that because they're going to go in a variety of different fields. And there are academic departments where we've gone into those departments. We've shared with them what their one through five alums are doing. And it's surprising to me that they're in a variety of different fields. So I heard the question both broadly, but also that there is that perceptual error that we're just, yeah. you know, Having students go in, funneling students into Finance, two different, financing two different itself. industries. Yeah, yeah. And, and yeah. obviously that's not the objective. That clearly isn't the goal. I think those students need to be prepared to go into finance and consulting, continue to support that, but also make sure that we aggregate it. And one thing that part of that is taking December break, for example. That's a six-week period of time where young people go home and their parents have said, Raj, what are we going to do? Our son and daughter's at home, there's nothing for them to do, their friends aren't back. Why not build in programming there that is not necessarily vocational, but what it does is it complements, again, through experiential learning, job shadowing opportunities, project-based assignments that are offered by our alumni employers and our parent employers and employers for three-week assignments. They might be working on a marketing uh, analysis or might be working on a spreadsheet for an organization or for a nonprofit, and then tuck. We have one of the top business schools in the country with one of the best undergraduate institutions in the country. You want to talk about a value proposition and preparedness is the signature program, Tuck Bridge, being offered to undergraduate students here at Dartmouth during the month of December beginning in 2014. So it really is expanding these opportunities and not necessarily the vocational, but peppering a little bit of that pre-professional programming through the Center for Professional Development, which should be our job and having that assistance and support from alumni relations. So, so you identified confidence, that broad-based training and flexibility. Would anybody else uh, add to that definition of what defines a, a well-prepared Dartmouth graduate, somebody who's ready to, to grow professionally throughout their career, throughout their life after Dartmouth? Anybody want to add something to that? Did he sum up the, every, all, every important uh, aspect of the definition there? We've got two down here and Chuck back there. You want to, do you want to start back there since you've got the microphone back there and we'll come down? Well, I've got a number of thoughts to share today, but on this one, I'm, I'm glad to see that we're striving to be more like Hamilton College in promoting communications and less like Harvard. <laughs> we do. do you we want to fill in the example at all there? Or, or wait? <laughs> Hamilton's been requiring public speaking of all their students for 50 or long, years or longer. Oh, wow. And some of my best professors at Dartmouth 50 years ago were graduates of Hamilton College. Yeah. And now I see <laughs> professors at Dartmouth who are more loyal to their profession than they are to the, this place or these students. Mm -hmm. So uh, I like to see us bring back the liberal arts. Now you mentioned Tuck School and the Bridge Program. That's a good opportunity too. Most of the Bridge students are for, for students some, from someplace else. So I don't think we need to grow Tuck to, to expand that for, as an opportunity for Dartmouth undergraduates. Right. And I'm glad to see that their school is beginning to justify their existence again by having a, a 401 program where there used to be a 3-2 program where it was a bridge for Dartmouth students into the world of work mm -hmm. and ideas and development. But what I hear today is that you're saying a Dartmouth degree won't get you a job. And maybe that's the case, that our students are gonna have to go out and to find their own jobs and build their own businesses. And that's where venture capitalism comes in, I guess. Is that right, Bill? 
Did we say a Dartmouth degree wouldn't get you a job, Chuck? <laughs> I don't think that came up. <laughs> but let's come down here. Uh, there was, yeah, right, right, yeah. Hello, I'm Lauren Parker. I work in the Office of Human Resources. And uh, I think one, one thing we sort of see a lot of recent college graduates who are coming into the uh, employment world. And I think sometimes this is not necessarily uh, to those who are graduating from Dartmouth, but that one of the, the things that's uh, that has come up that, that I've seen in, in some instances is that often um, people who are newer to the working world aren't accustomed to hearing constructive feedback about performance. And, uh, and certainly whole, that, it, that isn't limited is to the recent, recent graduates, but, uh, <laughs> but I'm just wondering if that, if that is something that you've looked at some programming around, uh, how, to, how to accept feedback and how to react to it in a um, proactive, yeah. productive you know, way. There's uh, several organizations, actually, that are bringing in either human resources professionals or outsourcing folks that work in colleges and universities in career and professional development to go talk to young people very specifically about how do we accept uh, constructive feedback and or criticism. Remember, this is a generation that is by far better versed than I think a lot of us uh, in technology. And because of their knowledge base, they feel that they're much more advanced than the generation Xers and the baby boomers. And there is some strife there within the workplace, as you've said before. We are working with students. We're working with students on a number of different issues. I think this is a great opportunity, and I've, I've talked to Ty about this in particular, about having an opportunity to work with our own human resources and issues such as this, and maybe cost of living analyses, et cetera, so students have a better understanding of their place around the table in the workplace, but also assisting with that pre-professional development and being prepared for jobs in different cities, et cetera. There's a number of things that we can talk about. But we are working with alums uh, who want to come to campus or do webinars specifically on business etiquette and how to conduct yourself at a table. For example, an alum has told me before that it's, it's uncomfortable to be in a meeting with a 23-year-old who's looking at their smartphone while I'm talking. <laughs> and it's unfortunate that those things happen. But we have to do a much better job at community. I think that's a great idea. But we want to partner with that. And I think, I think Lauren, I wonder for us in alumni relations, so one of the things we're just starting to do is starting to pilot a webinar series. And I wonder if this would be a topic that um, you know, graduates in the three to five most recent years would latch on to because they're also, they're the other side of the equation. They're experiencing discomfort and getting into a work environment feeling like, uh, they're, they're not valued or somebody's criticizing them unfairly and I just I wonder if there's a way do you do you guys have curriculum curricula that you use or materials that you use with um, Dartmouth employees to, to help kind of equip people for how to navigate that that we could steal from you and, and you know curriculum that we could develop for either current students or graduates because you're part of that ecosystem <laughs> yeah Thanks. Yeah, we are working on some curriculum on um, that that would have a module on sort of accepting feedback. It's through yeah. a third party vendor, yeah. and I haven't vetted that particular course yet. But yeah. it, it is something that's on our radar screen. Um, and I would, you know, right I would now bet, we don't have a formal program. On I would that. bet through our three separate professional networks. There's lots of I, I think you know there's lots of third party folks out there doing curriculum around issues like this, and I bet we could find. Um, either either an existing kind of delivery channel that's entertaining and would bring it home in the right way, or we could adapt some of that. I think it's a great it's a great topic. Oh, great, yeah, we'd love to chat with you. Great. <laughs> I'm Ty Dynas at Human Resources. <clears throat> you mentioned technology a couple of times and how this generation is very adept at the use of technology. I'm wondering how much of your programming involves. M making this generation more aware that what they say online creates sort of a permanent record that employers more and more are starting to pay more attention to. <laughs> so what programming would are you contemplating or doing that helps them with cultivating a professional online presence? You know, first thing ties, the last thing that you said is cultivating, right? And I think that's, that's the operative here. 
it's a major concern. You know, as we see young people on video all the time, Facebook, um, even some of the things that they'll tweet, uh, some of the things that they'll post on LinkedIn, some of us would shake our heads. Uh, we do workshops and networking, and networking is the apparatus by which we cultivate relationships. And that's a big part of the understanding is what is the apparatus that we use and what is the formality by which we use that apparatus. We do have workshops on social media. I know Chan Lee and, and KE as well as Leslie and, and Matt will be doing more of those workshops. We did them last spring about the etiquette of cultivation through that application, whatever that may be. Um, it's something that we talk about quite often in the office and things that we do talk about to students one-on-one, -on -one, small groups and in some of those workshops. But they are using technology and they use technology more than ever before to apply for jobs, to interact with alums or parents with employers. As a matter of fact, we had a student just a couple weeks ago interact with, a, with an alum and misspelled Dartman <laughs> because he decided to use his smartphone. And we tell students all the time, don't use your smartphones. But perhaps maybe what we should do as well, Ty, if we haven't already done so, is put, it, make some, put some marketing out there about the etiquette of communicating effectively, professionally, being aware of your image, being aware of your rhetoric anytime that you're cultivating or even communicating online. And I think that's uh, it's something that's imperative, for sure. And we'll continue to work on it. And I, I, I know, I think we only have one student in the room, so I won't pick on her. Um, but uh, uh, I think, to, you know, hopefully tonight Raj and I will get a chance to talk um, with a few more students. And I, the, the concern I have having, so I spent 21 years working in admissions interacted with lots of 17 and 18 year olds in the last 10 of those where social media was beginning to mushroom in lots of ways and saw students get themselves into all sorts of inter interesting kinds of problems. And I, the one concern, one of the concerns I would have is that we don't, um, we, we don't make the, the communication with recent graduates and current students adversarial and that we don't, uh, we don't start preaching to people about how to behave. <laughs> I don't know, you know, the, to find a way to engage to find a way to engage current students or recent grads in this conversation in a positive way, particularly those who have, who've done it well, and, and let them be examples to others or engage them through programming that Raj's office builds up um, in ways that's really positive. Um, I think there's this, it's the same with the workplace concern that Lauren raised, that, that concern of making people feel um, as if we're trying to make them fit into an old model rather than adjusting the model over time. There's gotta be some middle ground there. Um, and that's a, I think that's going to be a challenge as we, as we develop programming, particularly for recent grads, around these kinds of you know, workplace, uh, workplace values and, and, and uh, behavior, uh, getting a handle on that. And I think a lot of it too, though, Ty, is that employers need to take some responsibility in this as well and teach interns that very same thing. You know, part of an internship is not just learning a new skill or a competency, but understanding organizational culture. And perhaps maybe partnering better with employers and having them, when they come to campus, talk about some of those things, uh, those behavioral, organizational, behavioral things. Part of that being, you know, obviously how to use social media more effectively because sometimes what you see here on a college campus would be terms for a pink slip in any organization out there. And they don't know it. They don't get it. Victoria, you had a comment earlier? Or? Hi, Victoria Gonin in Alumni Relations with Dan. Um, one thing that I think would be helpful for students when they left Dartmouth was be able to articulate and sort of write their narrative as they go out in the world. So for example, um, just to be more self-aware of their strengths and every opportunity they had here while on campus and sort of what that was demonstrating. So, you know, when I talk to students, you know, they'll give you kind of this laundry list of courses they took and internships, but they haven't really sat down and sort of thought, you know, what is the theme? What is the narrative here? What is that story that I want to go out and tell the world? So, you know, I think it's part of that is self-reflection, you know, just time to sort of assess and then just really connect the dots so that if they have the opportunity, you know, whether it's three minutes or 30 minutes, they can articulate, you know, what these experience is brought brought forth for them. I I sometimes wonder if the pace of life here, 
uh, for students doesn't get in the way of some sort of synthesis. The, the, that kind of synthesis that you described doesn't seem like it should be very hard for us to reach, but we're, we're moving so quickly. I wonder if it, uh, you, have a, you, know, you have a son who went here. I wonder if it gets in the way. You, you, you get to the end of that four-year sprint and think, all right, great, I took care of all that, but you haven't tied it together in some way that synthesizes the experience. Yeah. But again, I think going out into the world looking for jobs, you know, if we spend time here on campus just sort of preparing them for that launch, you know, what is the story or what is the current yeah. story or how are you going to kind of, you know, summarize your four yeah. years here? Yeah. Victoria, um, the, what we're currently doing, I think you and I have talked about this offline, is the PDA program, the Professional Development Accelerator, which I talked about a few minutes ago. A component to that is a cloud-based phone application that works both with your iPhone and with your smartphone. We're using technology, so it goes back to the technology issue as well. What this phone application will do for the students that plug into the PDA is it creates milestones. And students have to complete a milestone to get to the next milestone, right? So it's progressive. It tells the students where they are in relation to the cohort of students by percentage. So if I've completed milestone number two, it will tell me that 75% of my peers have completed milestone number three. It builds into that competitiveness here at Dartmouth. But answering your question directly, it is very serious that we don't have the time today to reflect and to create those narratives. And there's two things that we're doing. Within those milestones, we're asking students after each term, because we don't do this, is to reflect on a class that you took that term. And what was the meaningfulness of that class and what can you take away from that particular class? And they write that out, and they put that into the cloud. And they can reflect on that. And we can go over that with them in an advising appointment. And we're going to do that with any of the experiential learning opportunities that they have as well. Complementing that, number two, are more deliberate programming and workshops on the narrative. For example, one of the things I'm going to be doing is talking about the 25-second pitch which is looking at value propositions that you, as a student, possess based on your academic, based on your internships or experiential learning opportunities, volunteer opportunities, things that you've done in the summer. And taking that from a broader perspective, what skill sets or competencies or life lessons have you learned within those opportunities so you can communicate that very effectively, very deliberately to an employer? And that'll be a piece of the PDA? That's a piece of the PDA. And have you guys tested the reflection that um, the, the reflecting on an experiential learning experience or a class with student with a small group of students yet? Are you we have. We did yeah. a design thinking where we looked at the program in general, but have we actually gone through the reflection piece? No, because the phone app won't be available right. until May. Right. I've only been here ten months. Now. I know. I know. <laughs> that wasn't a setup. I was I know, just curious. Right. No, but I'm thinking because I'm thinking if that's a if that's um, if it's a experience that's built in a way that can be, this almost counteracts what Victoria just said, but if it can be concise yep. and students can kind of plug in and do it yep. and it doesn't feel onerous, it's a great, then to be able to look back at that and tie two or three of those things Absolutely. together is great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that's what it should do. That's what it should do. Chuck, you had a comment earlier? Yeah. I'm sorry we're making you run around with the microphone. <laughs> Chuck might just want to come down here. <laughs> yeah. uh, the idea of, of business etiquette came up a few minutes ago. And I wanted to remind you that uh, sophomores, during sophomore summer for the last five or six years at least, have had an opportunity to take an etiquette class, yep. which is more than just knives and forks, although it is taught, taught by the grandson, I think, of Emily Post? Yes. From the, the Post Institute in Vermont. And uh, we'll be doing that again this summer. I'm meeting with Jennifer on on Wednesday, I guess, to discuss maybe a renaming it, rebranding it, something other than etiquette, something that might be more appealing or attract more Because it, it, kids. It, it does feel like knives and forks a little bit in terms that of... That sounds the, like you're yeah. teaching them to use old yeah. manners rather than the new manners. <laughs> and, uh, but that's, I think only about 100 students uh, sign up and, and come to that fancy dinner at the Hanover Inn. And, and, and how many, that... that um, how many sessions does that have? Is it just that one dinner or is it's it It's just a, one dinner. It's a part of the Class Connections program. Yeah. So the class of 66 will host the class of 16. Yeah. Actually, we co-host each other. So there will be 66s there at each table too. But um, 
mainly it's for the 16s. Yeah. But, the, you know, I wonder if there's a way, if you want more participants, I wonder if there's a way to raise the, the visibility of it with a slight rebranding and also an attachment to other things that, you know, Raj has in place. Is we, if we think about a number of experiences that alumni relations, that the class, that class connections, that the CPD might want to sponsor for sophomores during the sophomore yep. summer and yep. then tie them up in a, either in a, you know, one bigger umbrella brand or just cross promote them so that we pull more people in and they could say, oh, I went to that, I don't know, I went to that networking thing with Raj and, and I heard about the, the Post Institute thing, so now I'm going to go to that just to make sure that we're talking across the silos here a little bit. And, and we should talk offline because that's within the parameters of the PDA, yes. you know, that talking to the dean of the college and both Inga and Charlotte is what can we do through our office and partnering with other offices across campus to make that sophomore summer uh, a lot more focused or some focus on etiquette and other types of programming. And I don't have the right name for it either. I'm sure someone will come up with it. But getting these students interacting with alums earlier in their careers is going to suit them a lot better. It goes back to you know, the, the business etiquette and how to communicate, but also cultivation and then reflecting and, and sharing your narrative. The more opportunity that they have in front of folks, the better. Because you brought up the confidence issue, and one of the things that is alarming is that these particular students find it very difficult to go up to a person that they've never met, put their hand out, and try to find common ground. And we've got to do more work and provide more opportunities for students to do that. The and students so sophomore who seem summer to might be that opportunity. The students I've noticed since I retired eight years ago and came back here who have that skill are in the Hillwind Society, yeah. something they're teaching yeah. them yeah. to be confident and, and yeah. come up and talk with us. Yeah. Yeah. But tongue in cheek, we were thinking of renaming etiquette uh, pro-social behavior <laughs> 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 in light but, of recent headlines. But part, <laughs> part of um, you know, your question also raises the issue of, of um, the silos that exist in any institution. So, and you and I have had this conversation around other things before when we've developed edu an educational program that comes out of the alumni relations office, but it either mirrors or crosses paths with something that your class or the club that you were involved in has done. Um, so, you know, I don't, I'm not going to pick on Jeff, but I'll point out Jeff Harrell. And so Jeff has this amazing organization in the library system. And you are, do, you are in lots of ways, developing a, um, a curriculum that shadows the main curriculum. You're teaching skills that are, that are you know, supporting what students do in the classroom. You've got lots of workshops to help people better research, to help people find information, things that, that cross over with what Raj's shop will do. Um, and frankly, I guess I probably know about 1% of that programming that touches students or that taps into an alum coming back and sharing their expertise. We've got Rocky, we've got Dicker, we've got Dickey, we've got Tucker. I mean, we've got lots of, lots of different buckets here um, who have, you know, complementary goals and I think part of our challenge is how do we um, I don't know how do we you know how do we harness the energy in the same direction make, without stepping on each other or taking over somebody else's program how do we just make sure we complement it and um, you know if somebody needs help identifying an alum who can who can drive a program um, that they can find us in alumni relations so we can identify those alums with expertise and, and help with a program that Raj's staff might be doing and you know that I just feel like we've got lots of little pockets here around campus, and it's you know not as big a challenge as, as it is at a bigger institution, but we've got a lot of different buckets here where people are doing similar activities. Well, I think by hold, holding uh, meetings like this one, you can get between those silos and mm -hmm. maybe get past some of the institutional amnesia or institutional yep. Alzheimer's that I see. <laughs> I'll, I'll add to and, this. And I'm hoping that you will move on to the topic sometime rather than just how to help kids today get a job and, and, and survive in the, in the work world about how to help alumni mm -hmm. come back and do things that, that we want the college to do for us. I, I know that's uh, part of the Dartmouth for Life thought yep. and I'm, I'm looking forward to this conversation moving Great. in that direction. Great. Well, so Raj has a comment We'll just talk about ahead. the yeah. silos because that, that comes up at every institution I've ever worked at. So I know that Leslie Kingsley who works in the Center for Professional Development has been working with the grants coordinating committee. She's worked with, met with folks at Tucker and at Dickey and, and at Rocky. And we have a CMS system called Dartboard, right? So Dartboard hosts all of our internships, our employment opportunities, all of our workshops, collaborative programming, and information sessions. 
The good work that Leslie's doing is working with those particular centers to have them upload electronically the experiential learning opportunities that they possess as well as their funding applications if they can. Some of these funding applications are very large. And if they can't be uploaded, then at least what we can do is help market those. And the reason I bring this up is because before all of this, you'd have to go into each and every one of those centers to look through what I saw were some binders. But if students are studying abroad or they're doing some sort of an internship off campus, it gives them an opportunity to look for those opportunities in Dartboard. And the other thing that we're doing to break down silos is being much more transparent. Using Dartboard, we're giving faculty access to Dartboard to view all the internships, the employment opportunities, the workshops, the collaborative programming, and information sessions done by employers. So every time a student has contact with a faculty, if he or she chooses that faculty member, they can go on Dartboard and actually look up internships or job opportunities or even funding applications if they prefer. Number two, we're giving access to Dartboard to our undergraduate deans and our folks in OPAL. So every contact that they have with students is similar to what the faculty have that they can begin to talk about experiential learning, concrete opportunities that they can apply for, funding, etc. But it gets better. Now I'm sounding like an info commercial. We're giving <laughs> access to Dartboard to parents. Only to view. They can't cut and paste these opportunities and send it to their child at another institution, right? <laughs> we don't want that. But what it does is it allows parents to have those conversations, those reflection conversations that Victoria had talked about. What did you study this term? What do you want to do during your off term that is perpendicular to what you're studying? What kind of an experiential learning opportunity? Let's look at Dartboard together because they're a part of the ecosystem as well. So I think by breaking down silos and opening up opportunities across campuses is being transparent and that's ongoing. So I just told Arts and Humanities that they'll be the first group of faculty to have access to Dartboard and then we'll go by division. And then to, to pick up the, the, the next topic you raised, Chuck, um, supporting alumni as they grow through their career and make transitions. So the, the place we're starting right now is with young alums, uh, partly because, frankly, that's where there's a, a tremendous amount of need. Um, young alumni who have graduated from Dartmouth in the last five years have graduated into an economy unlike anything that any of us graduated into in the 25, 30, or 40 years previous to that. So what we're doing in the next couple of months is a uh, couple of things to try to engage young alums around this issue, um, both to get them to share their expertise with current students and, and engage with current students, but also to try to offer services. So, we're beginning next week, or beginning the end of this week, we're targeting the first five classes out and trying to pull them into the Dartmouth Career Network, uh, which is on a new platform, uh, has better functionality than it used to have. So the Dartmouth Career Network is an online directory of alumni who volunteered to be a part of a community to share career advice, but frankly, it's not a community that's been engaged directly in any way in the recent past. So there are very few young alumni in that career network either using it to get help or using it to offer, offer advice to, to undergraduate students. So the first piece is to pull young alums into that network and revitalize it a little bit. Um, the second piece is to begin through Raj's shop. Um, he's very generously, and his staff is very generously on a short-term basis, offered to open up advising to alums in their first five years out and see what kind of feedback we get from that. We, we've done some uh, through survey work. We, we have an indication that they're looking for that advice, but. We'll see how, how they respond to getting advice from, from folks in Raj's shop. So we have some, some Fridays in April and May where we're, we're reaching out to young alums and, and offering them the opportunity to connect with Raj's staff and advising. And then we're launching a webinar series targeted around particular issues that we think are uh, based on survey data that we think are of interest to alums in their first five years out. So applying to graduate school, some uh, ways to use online tools to better build your network, and Raj is going to lead that conversation. A skills assessment um, for changing jobs that uh, Frida Pauly, who's a Dartmouth 85, is going to host a webinar with us for that. And we're building a couple of other topics out to see what people's responses are to that. So for, for the young alumni, I think it's a more, um, it's a little bit more of a concrete, co concrete topic because they're at a particular stage of life. They're, they're making the transition from a first job to a second job. They may be in a lot of different industries, but, but there's, it's, a, 
it's an easier problem to grab onto and solve in some ways and begin to see how we can get information out there, either just through online tools or, or you know, when they're here on campus. And then the other piece that we're doing right now is we're working with Alumni Council uh, on a proposal around uh, building a professional development committee in Alumni Council that will, that will think about alumni programming and serving students and how we, how we better kind of build that bridge between students and alums. Um, so the, the Dartmouth Career Network has lots of content to come, better content, um, but it's on a better platform. It's on a, a platform that functions well now, and we're in a good position to sort of have that take off and, and launch. The piece that isn't as clear is R Raj's team has done a good job in the last few months um, consolidating opportunities for students in one place in an online board that's accessible. Uh, we think we have pretty clear instructions for alumni that we can start to push out to say, hey, if you want to create an internship or hire a student, here's where you go and here's how you do it. Um, what we don't have yet in terms of a really good, easy community is I'm an alum who's really good at what I do. I have a business and I want to I share that with other alums. I want to hire other alums. We don't have an alumni to alumni board that functions the way Dartboard functions, the, the, the employer to student board. So one of the next technological hurdles we have to get over is what's the right environment to do that in? Where do we engage alumni in connecting with one another online? So if I'm, I'm somebody who's a, who's a career coach or I'm somebody who's a certified financial planner and I want to let other alums know how good I am at this, I can be in an environment where I can let alums know about that. I'm an alum who's hiring. I don't want to hire recent grads or, or current students because that's not what I'm looking for, but I want to let people know about this CIO position that I have. How can I do that in a way that will be really easy for, for other Dartmouth alums to, to know? And do we do that in LinkedIn, or do we do that on a, on a separate platform that's easy to access? And that's one of the pieces that we're wrestling with and sort of looking at. And then the other, the other piece that we're working with Raj on is developing industry-specific programming that puts alums and students physically in the same place. So doing some things here on campus, but also off campus where we, um, we're working with Leslie Kingsley developing some, a program called Off the Green, where students spend a day immersed in a, in, in a particular career or industry, and then that night they come together with a group of alums in a reception to, to learn more about the industry and connect with people and network. And we also did the virtual career fair right. with some alumni yeah. employers in, in San Francisco, again, diversifying opportunities across industries and also geographically. And I think we had over 506 students and young alums on that platform, I think over 136 were most qualified, which means they got a second interview. So we're doing things like that. But you know, you really got me excited. <laughs> and the one thing is, Monica Wilson, who is the best director of employer relations in the country. She's in the room. And she's in the room. Which I said it publicly, <laughs> now she'll tell me, remind me of that. But she told me, and Monica, you can nod your head yes or speak up, but I think you said to me at one point, and this goes back to your point, is that 90% of the folks that interview Dartmouth students on campus are alumni. Now, if we can expand that to have them interview alums with alums, we're going to paint that labor market green. Right? Well, I hear a lot of good ideas. What I, what I haven't, Dartmouth is a liberal arts institution, or at least it was. And it what I haven't is. heard, what I haven't heard is, uh, a lifelong learning in the liberal arts for alumni. Maybe this would appeal to the people who are 25 and 30 years out. Mm -hmm. And Dartmouth used to have such a program. And we, it was called the Dartmouth Institute. Mm -hmm. The name has been stolen by a health institute here <laughs> on campus, and I really hope they changed their name. Because we had a good program going on in the 80s and the 90s. I have some of the literature with me, but more than that, we have one of the program directors with us here today, too. Jane. <laughs> And I tried to tell you a little bit about that the other day, but Dan, but I didn't have any lit with me, and I called Jan this morning, and she came in and brought some of it along, which was, it was a program, well, should I let you, do you want to talk about it, what it was? Sure. This is a program that ran for 22 years, uh, started during uh, Kemeny's uh, reign, and uh, it was a four-week liberal arts program yep. that invited there were very few alumni that came to it. It was mostly for corporate executives, senior executives, that um, would come for a four-week experience with their spouses. And it was a totally interdisciplinary program <clears throat> with liberal arts. We had six faculty, and they combined their different uh, fields. We had art, and s art science, history, 
um, I don't know, we had, I think, six different fields, and we, um, the art and history might do something together, science and, and English might do something together, and it was very well liked by the, the um, executives that came because they were used to marketing, right. finance courses. Yeah, the, the executive education piece that happens at Tuck now. That right, and they yeah. weren't, you know, they didn't have things that made them think outside the box, yeah. basically. So it went, as I said, 22 years, and uh, I had it for the last nine. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I'm happy to answer. I remember the Dartmouth Institute. I okay. Was here. <laughs> Great. All right. Great. Go ahead, Eli. Um, I just want to. Oh, actually, we're, I think because they're recording, they're going to make you get a mic, though. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, Eli Burakian, class of 2000. Um, so I just want to put um, a little bug in your guys' ear about the idea of graduating and not, have, not going into a job or a career. Because I think more and more, so I was on this, um, the outdoor programs office career panel thing yesterday. And um, I had a good, good chance to ch chat with um, uh, Lisa Densmore, yeah. who's done a lot of work, you know, in writing, producing TV, you know, really just very multifaceted career. And, you know, we were discussing how sort of, you know, you could go and get a staff job as a photographer, as a writer 20 years ago. Now you have to be a lot more proactive and basically market yourself. Yeah. Um, and I think more and more employment opportunities are going to become sort of an individual thing and, and, and not necessarily working for somebody but working for yourself you know I had to go through that when I became self-employed you know I was doing books I was doing weddings I was doing consulting a little bit of everything to pursue the career that I wanted to do so I would say both you know helping people access resources and best market their own abilities and the things that they can do really well and realizing, you know, you're not going to be able to do everything right on the at the outset, but, you know, if you can, if you can try to, you know, have the long, long range approach, and do as much as you can, I think more and more these, these jobs are going to be self-employed jobs or with a friend on a project for, you know, and that's accessing grant money, accessing, you know, marketing yourself, all that, and also understanding that your career goal may be. A, you know, I know photography, so that's what I'm going to say. Your career goal may be to be, be a photographer. I still worked in a consulting firm for four years until I made that jump to become a photographer. So understanding that, you know, this is not your final resting place. You know, do good work, but here are some other resources to pursue that career that you really want to be, you know, the, the end the, the end stop, the end location. So less just like traditional careers and more of like, as you discussed, I mean, it's a very different working place than even when I graduated, you know, 14 years ago. Yeah. So, um, and I think more and more it's going to become that way. The people who can show their work, display their work, and market themselves the best are going to get the most employment opportunities. Well, it's like what we were talking about with reflection in the portfolio. First and foremost, uh, thank you for being on the panel yesterday for Careers in the Outdoors. It was fantastic, and your message is, is right on. As I said when I first started, what's contributing to the unemployment issue in this country is that employers are hiring on projects. So it's no longer I'm going to hire you full time. I'm going to hire you for six months to do an assignment. And that's part of it. But the other part of it is going back to what Victoria said, and it's utilizing a portfolio or reflection piece because many of our students and it goes back to up here about the liberal arts is they're interested in a lot of different things and you like yourself as you said yesterday as well is you can encapsulate all of these things and do a variety of things the other thing that you touched upon and we have these conversations they're very purposeful conversations that take place in 20-minute advising appointments in the Center for Professional Development is work-life balance not everybody wants to go to Wall Street and work 80 hours a week. And they have different interests, different hobbies that they want to pursue. And what took place yesterday afternoon that you were involved in was just an indication of what a variety of things that students can do. And so that's what we want to continue to do. And that's the dare to be different. You don't have to go through recruiting 
As you notice, we took the corporate out of recruiting. You don't have to go through recruiting, but you can create a portfolio and be sort of your own intra, not entre, but intrapreneur, right? And it, it, it comes right back to the very first comment, right? If, you've got, if we've got a, an ecosystem that encourages confidence, you've got a broad-based liberal arts curriculum that, that prepares you across, across a series of disciplines, and you've got the ability to be flexible and shift gears, whether that's learned through the Dartmouth plan, whether that's learned through internships and experiential learning, then you're better set up to be resourceful and, and figure that out. It's, a, it's, it's a still a scary prospect, but if we can instill that, create this ecosystem that encourages that, it, it, it sets people up for that, that ability to shift gears and make that progression. And one, thing that, and one thing that Lisa was mentioning at the table was, you know, anything that you've done to promote the good work you've done, even if it's for a class, you can use that as part of your portfolio. And then simple things like, for example, joining professional organizations, because they will list opportunities for these projects right. that will give you more experiences and will get you more jobs. So right. it's not always, yeah, just a long-term thing, but even if you can get a job for a week to do this cool thing, it might help you in the future to get other work. Great. Thanks, Eli. Somehow we've reached 1 o'clock, and Naraya is standing, which means that she probably wants us to give her a chance to tell you what comes up next on the Moving Dartmouth Forward agenda. Thank you very much for Thank your you. questions and your participation. And um, what, what more do you need from us, yeah, Naraya? Great. Thank great. You. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> So just very briefly want to mention our upcoming session. So if you know folks who couldn't make it today and who are able to come this evening, please tell them to join us at 630 in the Fahey Ground Floor Lounge. Um, and we have added quite a few sessions for the spring term. You can always find them on the President's Office webpage. But just briefly, um, next week we're doing faculty recruitment and retention. Those are 12 o'clock in Dartmouth 105 and then 630 in Fahey Ground. The 22nd, which is a Tuesday, so we're sort of breaking our regular cycle. We're actually um, doing a session on addressing sexual assault at Dartmouth. For those of you who weren't able to attend last week's symposium, where they sort of did a broad overview of the college's current practices, policies, some new things we're doing, what's our general philosophy moving forward, this would be a great session for folks to attend if they're interested in that. Um, those also have a slight change in timing, so it's the 22nd at noon and then 5.30. And uh, Arts and Innovation with Tripp Davis and Adrian Randolph on the 28th of this month, talking about arts and innovation, our plans for that sector of campus. And then finally, on May 12th, Global Learning Experiences with Lynn Higgins, excuse me, and Lindsay Whaley. Um, we're looking at doing some new programs across the curriculum. Would love your input and feedback, so hope lots of folks will come out for that. We may be adding one or two more for the remainder of this term, so I just invite you to always check the President's Office page for updates, and we do post to the events calendar. So thanks for coming out. Thanks. thanks. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah. um, two 